Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for attending today. As mentioned, my name is Anna Laws. I am the food security analyst in the FuseNet Washington, D.C. office responsible for Central America. And today I'm going to present our Central America food security outlook briefing for the period of June 2024 to January 2025. Today's briefing will begin with our key messages for the outlook period, and then I'll move on to an overview of the current situation that will cover both our presence country of Guatemala and the remote monitoring countries of El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Then I'll review the key assumptions that we've developed for the outlook period and at the end discuss our projected outcomes for the region through January 2025. So to start, um, I will review our key messages. Multiple parts of the dry corridor, as well as Northern Honduras and Alta Verapaz and the Alta Plano in Guatemala will experience crisis IPC phase three outcomes between June and September, coinciding with the peak of the lean season. Climate shocks in recent years resulting in below average staple grain harvests as well as persistently high prices have negatively impacted poor households resiliency and many are relying on unsustainable coping strategies to cover their food needs during the lean season. The situation will gradually improve to stressed IPC phase two outcomes for most areas between October and January with the Primera and Postera harvests and seasonal increases in labor demand for cash crops. However, crisis IPC phase three outcomes are expected to persist in some parts of Guatemala, where seasonal improvements will not be sufficient to overcome agricultural losses, limited food stocks, and heavy market reliance amid above average prices. So right before we dive into our current situation, just as a reminder, in the region, around 40% of the population lives in rural areas, and most rural households engage in agricultural activities such as subsistence farming and small-scale production. These households grow maize and beans for their own consumption and supply the labor for coffee, sugar cane, and other cash crop production. These agricultural activities are governed by weather patterns that consist of two rainy seasons separated by a drier period. The rainy seasons mark the start of crop planting and are essential for crop development as too much or too little rainfall can negatively impact crops by causing delays in planting and harvesting times and encouraging the proliferation of pests and diseases. So speaking of those rainy seasons, let's go into our seasonal calendar for a typical year. So as seen on the calendar in June, our current situation month, um, is typically in the middle of the first rainy season and the middle of the lean season. The annual lean season typically starts in April and it peaks between June and August and lasts until the Primera season harvests in late August or sometimes early September. The lean season is characterized by the depletion of subsistence staple grain reserves, reduced income generating opportunities, and seasonal increases in food prices. When the Primera harvest of staple grains comes, it increases both food availability and local agricultural labor opportunities for poor households. And then right after that Primera season harvest, households will begin to sow for the Postrera season um, just as that second rainy season begins. And this also provides local agricultural income opportunities for poor households. Also beginning in the current situation month is the annual hurricane season, it typically begins in June and ends in November, although in recent years it has extended into December. It's typically characterized by excessive rainfall accompanied by winds and storm activity, and that can sometimes lead to flooding, river overflows, landslides, uh, which can all damage crops and infrastructure. Another important event during the outlook period is the peak season of income generation in rural areas, which is closely linked to seasonal production cycles. Beginning in October, the demand for seasonal agricultural labor increases for various cash crops, such as coffee and sugarcane, 
And agricultural day laborers typically migrate to be employed in major production areas for periods of time ranging from between two to about six months. And this will last from October through February or March, and the harvest of cash crops significantly increases labor demand um, for poor rural households that migrate for this type of employment. And also, just a side note, the availability of employment abroad in Mexico, um, or for example, if they're migrating from somewhere else in Central America to Honduras, on coffee and fruit plantations, among other types of cash crops, also peaks during this period. So moving on to discuss the current climate conditions in the region. This is an updated figure from what was utilized in the June outlook, uh, but was included to provide up the most up-to-date information. The figure describes the probability of an ENSO state, La Nina shown in blue, neutral shown in gray, and El Nino shown in red. And as you can see in the graph, we're no longer in an El Nino. These El Nino conditions were present last year and during the first half of this year. And El Nino is typically characterized by below average rainfall for Central America. And that we have seen as there's been observed below average rainfall this year with multiple areas of abnormal dryness in the lead up to the, premier, the current Primera rainy season, um, with many areas showing below average soil moisture and vegetative health. But we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so looking back to the graph, we're currently in ENSO neutral for the period of JAS, which signifies July, August, and September, with La Nina conditions as the most likely phase by October. So getting into a little bit more into this shift from El Nino to neutral to La Nina, um, once we're full on into this La Nina, I just want to describe a little bit what a typical La Nina looks like for the region. So La Nina is characterized by the opposite conditions of an El Nino event with above average rainfall likely across Central America. While above average rainfall can be good, it also comes with different risks to rural livelihoods like localized flooding, landslides, and crop losses in affected areas. Uh, while food and cash crops are typically likely to develop normally, um, high temperatures and wet conditions can increase the risk of pests and diseases, which is of particular importance for beans, which is a crop very sensitive to moisture. So as I said, we would get a little bit more into what we had been seeing in the current situation month. Um, the Primera rainy season began in June with cumulatively high levels. Despite being almost one month delayed, this increased rainfall did improve soil moisture in the short term, which enabled uh, the growth of crops to begin. But uh, due to the erratic nature of the rainfall by the end of the month, many areas were still reporting below average total rainfall. For example, as of June 20th, most of Honduras and eastern Nicaragua continue to report deficits of up to 45% in total accumulated rainfall. So on the left here, you're going to see a figure showing the seasonal precipitation amount as a percentage of the average for the 1st of April through the 15th of June, which should be the start of the Primera rainy season. But as you can see across the region, there's lots of red and orange colors, which is denoting precipitation amounts that are between 45 to 75 percent of what is expected or average during that time. The red, orange and yellow colors show widespread below average rainfall across the region. And then on the right, we have a figure showing areas experiencing a record low amount of season, seasonal precipitation in that same April to June time period of this year. And what you can see with the darkest red areas is denoting that it is the driest season on record during that period of time. Um, the lighter red is showing that it's the second driest season on record. And that orange color is showing that it's the third driest season on record. And many of these areas overlap with where subsistence farmers have seen the worst production losses uh, in the past. Also, 
An important note is that in addition to below average rainfall, high temperatures have also contributed to the delays and the increased likelihood and prevalence of wildfires, which further exacerbates disruptions to crop development and potentially crop destruction. So moving on to discuss the current Primera season harvest. On the left, you can see a figure showing soil moisture anomalies for May of 2024. So right before that current situation month, it shows soil moisture depth up to 100 centimeters down into the soil, which is a really critical space for crop growth and development. So typically the rainy season is underway at this point and we should see improving soil moisture conditions but this year due to that one month delay the widespread soil moisture deficits seen in the light orange and the darker orange colors um, are almost across the entire region the areas shown in blue are indicating a surplus of soil moisture um, or also average conditions as well the extension of the dry spell and the delay in the arrival of the rains expected in April and May harmed or prevented the planting of Primera staple grains on time. For those farmers who planted seeds during the typical seasonal times, the delay resulted in a loss of seed as there was not enough rainfall and soil moisture to support crop growth. Due to the significant increase in production costs for replanting, this particularly impacted subsistence producers and only some of those farmers chose or were able to replant. And many of those decided to plant in a smaller area with a smaller amount of crops. Also due to the shift in planting dates, the last stages of crop development are likely to coincide with the seasonal rainfall peak of the second rainy period, which is likely to affect plants due to excess rainfall, winds, and humidity when typically these crops would have already been harvested by the time the second rainy season begins. These crop losses and less area planted will lead to overall lower yields. Harvest typically lasts for two to three months or the harvest will last as uh, in the household for two to three months, depending on the number and members in the household. But due to lower yields in some areas like the dry corridor of the region, many households will only have enough to last around one month. Lower household reserves will not last through the entire lean season and households will have to prematurely rely on market purchases to meet their food needs. The situation is exacerbated by coinciding with the time of year that market prices for staple grains are the highest before the next harvest season begins. So getting into those um, high food prices a little bit more, a combination of shocks over the last three years with both climatic and macroeconomic factors have distorted seasonal trends and are driving persistently high staple food prices. Although the market has remained relatively well supplied and is operating normally, typical seasonal declines in prices have been either minimal or non-existent and this trend has continued with the release of the recent Primera season harvest. The lower local production of staple grains, the flow of staggered harvests into the market, and high costs for producers have maintained high prices for both white maize and black beans. In Guatemala in June, the price of maize showed a slight reduction compared to June 2023 but still remains around 15% above the five-year average. The price of black beans remains 15 and 43% higher than last year and the five-year average, respectively. In the rest of Central America, the monthly change in the price of red beans is similar to that of maize, with Nicaragua reporting a 6% increase in May and El Salvador and Honduras showing stability due to imports and good commercial production in the case of Honduras. However, prices of beans throughout the region remain between 38 and 63 percent above the five-year average due to the regional gap in production from crop losses over the last five years. 
As I previously mentioned, uh, high food prices mean that households will need to spend a higher percentage of their household income in order to meet those food needs, which does reduce their overall purchasing power. Uh, specifically for households in the dry corridor of the region, purchasing power will be even more restricted as they've experienced previous low harvest seasons, which have deteriorated livelihood assets. And these households have been market dependent for a longer period of time. I will now turn to discuss some of our key assumptions through January of 2025. First up is uh, what rainfall and temperature um, are anticipated to look like. So I've already mentioned erratic rainfall during the Primera season, but looking ahead, climate forecasts are showing above average rainfall throughout the projection period. As you can see, this is the case in the climate forecast on the left with rainfall probability for the July to September period um, with the areas in darker green indicating precipitation as much as 70% above average. Above average rainfall, while it can be beneficial, also increases the risk of flash floods, river overflows, and landslides. In addition, the increasing prevalence of pests and diseases associated with excess rainfall is most likely to negatively impact crop production and result in a rising number of farmers who are choosing to grow fewer moisture sensitive crops, such as beans, as I mentioned. And these effects will likely decrease the yields of staple grains, which limits the availability at the local level, um, which could uh, and is most likely to cause prices to increase farther. There's also a forecast of above average temperatures, which is shown here uh, in the forecast on the right, uh, also for the July to September period. And this combination of climate factors of above average rainfall and increased temperature is anticipated to cause uh, Primera subsistence crop losses towards the end of the season, as well as delay the planting for the Prostrera season, especially for subsistence farmers in the region's dry corridor. Lastly, increased temperatures also contribute to the likelihood of pests and disease outbreaks impacting crop production. So moving on to discuss what staple grain harvests will look like. Um, so as I've alluded to a couple of times, both the Primera and Prostrera cycle staple grain harvests are expected to be delayed one month due to that late arrival of the first rainy season this year. But commercial production of staple grains is expected to remain within the average. And this is due to the fact that commercial producers have access to a lot of resources that subsistence farmers don't, like irrigation. So moving on to discuss some labor supply and demand. Agricultural labor demand through the outlook period is likely to be average for large scale and commercial producers, and in the case of migration labor demand, but it will be below average for small scale producers of uh, cash crops and staple grains. In recent years, climate variations have affected coffee production on small scale farms, and low market prices have been the major contributor that limits the sale of cardamom. And this year, According to USDA forecasts, due to the dry conditions in the first half of 2024, the amount of coffee produced in El Salvador, Honduras, and Costa Rica is anticipated to be below average, which is likely to reduce the number of opportunities for cash crop labor. And in addition, the potential for below average staple grain harvests during the Primera and Prostrera seasons is also most likely to decrease local opportunities for earning income from agricultural labor in clearing fields, planting, weeding, et cetera. Lastly, migration patterns, both through and out of the region, have shifted aspects of labor supply and demand throughout Central America in recent years. In particular, permanent migration to the United States uh, has increased in recent years, uh, especially since the pandemic, which does overall decrease the availability of agricultural labor in the region. Mm 
moving on to discuss staple grain prices. Um, headline inflation and food inflation are both expected to remain elevated for the duration of the outlook period, but they'll be below the peaks from last year. Year-on-year -year inflation has since slowed, but food prices remain above average. And for FuseNet's price projections for staple grains, we're seeing a seasonal modest decline beginning now as harvests begin, but prices will remain above the five-year averages throughout the analysis period. In the case of maize, prices will remain nearer to average due to fewer seasons of cumulative crop losses and imports generally supporting price stability. But in the case of beans, due to multiple seasons of major crop losses due to its moisture sensitivity, prices remain high above the five-year average in all four countries. As you can see in the graph for Guatemala, the black line denotes 2024 prices and the accompanying price projections through the rest of the projection period. The blue line denotes 2023 prices and the gray bars indicate the five-year average. This graph has been updated to include data from July of 2024 uh, and demonstrates maize prices above both the 2023, or sorry, bean prices, <laughs> above both the 2023 and five-year averages for March to July of 2024. And as you can see, the projection of above average prices is most likely to continue through January of 2025. This is also just um, an example, there are in the annex of this presentation, uh, the price projections for all four countries for both maize and beans that we can reference after the presentation is over. So now let's move on to what this all means in terms of projected food security outcomes. So to start, I wanna reiterate the difference of FuseNet mapping between presence and remote monitoring countries. FuseNet conducts remote monitoring in El Salvador, Honduras, and Nicaragua. So the outline you're seeing around those countries is indicative of at least one area within that country facing the phase indicated. And it does not mean that the entire country is experiencing that phase at the area level. And also as a reminder, in accordance with IPC protocol, as we move from the household level to an area level classification, it means that at least 20% of a given area's population uh, is meeting the criteria for a particular phase, but it's likely that households within that area are experiencing different phases. Urban areas across the region are expected to maintain minimal or IPC phase one outcomes. So I'm gonna focus instead on rural areas. On the map on the left, we're showing our most likely outcomes for the June to September of 2024 period. And then on the right, we have our most likely outcomes for the October 2024 to the January 2025 period. For most rural areas across the region, the reduction of poor households purchasing power has pushed them to adjust the quality and diversity of food in their diets and to cut back on non-essential expenditures to cover their food needs. This is likely to continue throughout the outlook period, resulting in stressed or IPC phase two outcomes through September. For the June to September period, households experiencing crisis or IPC phase three outcomes is most likely during the peak of the lean season between June and August, with some additional areas experiencing these outcomes. Those additional areas are located in the dry corridor of the region, northern Honduras, and the Alta Verapaz and Altiplano regions of Guatemala. In these areas, sporadic agricultural labor demand will be below average, while food prices remain elevated, just as households are the most market dependent. Until the arrival of the Primera harvest, households in these areas will be cutting back on food quantity, will be taking on unsustainable debt, resorting to atypical migration of additional household members, and potentially selling productive assets in order to meet their minimum food needs. Lastly, in the worst affected areas of Guatemala, which are in the Alta Verapaz and Altiplano regions, some households are expected to face crisis or IPC phase three outcomes for the duration of the outlook period, due to the fact that poorer households have incurred significant debts in recent years, and they've been producing below average volumes of staple grains in recent years, both of which have been forcing prolonged market dependence. So lastly, just wanna to quickly touch on an event that may change the scenario. As I mentioned, it's currently hurricane season. 
um, and weather is a main driver of acute food insecurity throughout the region and weather shocks in recent years have reduced productivity in certain areas. So in particular, the hurricane strikes of Ada and Iota in 2020. Um, the hurricane season in the Atlantic typically stretches from June to November, sometimes into early December. And this year, there's a high probability of above average hurricane activity. Impacts from hurricanes are not something FuseNet takes into account in the most likely scenario because hurricane paths are impossible to predict in advance and above average activity will not necessarily translate to a hurricane strike in any of the covered countries. Uh, but a tropical storm or hurricane is considered an event that may change the scenario because depending on the trajectory and magnitude of the storm, the impacts could include heavy rains with flooding, soil erosion, landslides, mudslides, etc. Um, which could all alter crop production prospects, damage roads and infrastructure, negatively affect other sources of income and food, disrupt trade flows, market functionality, um, which then in turn affects market supply and income sources and all of that. So uh, that is it for today. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have.